Number 340 is we prepare to give our tithes and offerings to the Lord. Let's stand, please, and sing, Verily, verily, I say unto you, you must be born again. 340. 340. Oh, what a Savior that he died for me. From condemnation he hath made me free. He that believeth on the Son saith he hath everlasting life. Verily, verily, I say unto you, verily, verily, message ever new. He that believeth on the Son, tis true, hath everlasting life. All my iniquities on him were laid, all my indebtedness by him was paid. All who believe on him, Lord hath said, hath everlasting life. Verily, verily, I say unto you, verily, verily, message ever new. He that believeth on the Son, tis true, hath everlasting. We'll sing three and four together. Though poor and needy, I can trust my Lord. Though weak and sinful, I believe his word. Oh, glad message every child of God hath everlasting life. Verse 4. Though all unworthy, yet I will not doubt. For him that cometh, he will not cast out. He that believeth, oh, the good news shout. Hath everlasting life. Verily, verily, I say unto you, verily, verily, message ever new. He that believeth on the Son, tis true, hath everlasting life. Thank you. You may be seated. Psalm 103 and verse 13 says, Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. Amen. For he know, knoweth our frame, he remembereth that we are dust. As for man, his days are as grass, as a flower of the field, so he flourisheth. For the wind passeth over it, and it is gone, and the place thereof shall know, know it no more. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear him, and his righteousness unto children's children, to such as keep his covenant and those that remember his commandments to do them. And, you know, as unlike uh, other religions that are out there today or in times past, you know, our God knows who we are. Yes, sir. And he's been one of us, yes. right? <laughs> so he, he's been through all the things that we've had to, gone, had to go through. And, and more, and uh, he pitieth us. Yes, he knows us that, you know, we're frail, we're imperfect, and uh, uh, we can't do everything that even we would like to do, uh, and he's uh, gracious for us. It says, the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting, uh, to such as keep his covenant, and he's given us a new covenant. Amen. And we kind of pass over that word a little bit, um, covenant and it meant a whole lot more uh, back in the day it was I would give to you before I take for myself mm -hmm. so when we entered into this partnership your needs became my priority and today you know we have a marriage covenant and uh, when there's this little ceremony when they cut the cake and what do people do nowadays well they slam the cake into the oh, spouse's okay. face right but that's actually a representation that I will feed you before I feed myself. That's good, so that's that's part of the, the marriage covenant. So he has given us a covenant, and that means he will take care of us uh, from everlasting to everlasting according to his promise and not ours. So let's pray. Father, I thank you this morning, Lord, for all the folks here today. I thank you for a, a church where we can come and learn more about you, Lord, and, and be close to you, Lord. We ask that uh, you bless the offering, Lord, give those who manage the finances, the wisdom to uh, to work with it, Lord. 
help us to set priorities and goals and, and to be responsible for it, Lord, and that uh, you would perform miracles where uh, we need it, Lord, for your support, uh, because we can't do this on our own, Lord. We can't sustain our own, uh, our own idea, uh, ideas, Lord, uh, but you can uh, for us, and we thank you for uh, your guidance and protection. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord, Melody. Thank you so much. That song talks about, uh, I'm knowing, I'm, I know I'm going to see some great things in heaven, but I, the one I really want to see is Jesus, the one who died for me. And the person talks about how I clapped my hands and cried, holy, holy, holy. And let me guarantee you, heaven's a lot more exciting than floating around on a cloud and strumming a harp. And if, it, if that's all it was... That would still be sweet. <laughs> Those of us who get along in life a uh, few decades, that just sounds really good, frankly. But there's a lot more to it than that. Hey, listen, uh, the Warriors in the finals, that's, you know, that's, that's pretty exciting stuff. But you take all the excitement in, in that auditorium, in that gymnasium, and all the people there, multiply it by a million times. And you, 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 you just about maybe can touch the hem of the garment of what it's going to be like when we see our Lord in heaven, that level of excitement. And people would spend $14,000 or more for a, a, a good seat in that, in that auditorium, uh, that, that gymnasium. Uh, let me tell you, there will be a lot of Christians who are going to be back in the crowd wishing I'd done a little, I wish I'd done a little bit more for the Lord and got a, a seat closer to the throne. And all these things we talk about that we tend to, you know, tend to just poo-poo and it's like, uh, you know, so, so what's the big deal about that? You know, when we get right into it, you're going to realize it really was a big deal. Good to have you in church this morning. And uh, I, I appreciate the Brother Balser. Frankly, I have seen many of the cut the cake and share it. Uh, not too many that have gone that extreme. I, I know that it happens of smashing the, the, the cake in the other person's face. But, uh, but I did not, I, not till this morning, I came to church to learn something today. I, I, and, it, and now, I'll never look at that ceremony the same again. The idea of, I am now pledged to share that with you. Go ahead, Jake. Your dad showed that to you. That is so cool. And then I was sitting here thinking, Jake, how wonderful it is that, you know, I, I have a list of our, of our key men, and I rotate, you know, who does what prayer and who does scripture and so forth. And, and uh, so I wrote, so, so I tried to make it fair among some, some key guys. And it, and it just happened to be Jake this morning. And, and I think about that scripture and about, uh, you know, a, a, as a father cherisheth his, cherisheth his children. I'm thinking about you, of course, and your kids, and particularly today, Cora. And then you talked about children's children. I thought, how cool that you're that Cora's grandparents are here this morning, and it just, you see the Holy Spirit putting it all together. Now, if you'll be patient with me, I'll give you a scripture in a few moments, but first I want to share with you some thoughts. We'll have prayer, then I'll give you a scripture. 
If you are a normal, rational adult or teenager, you want to accomplish something worthwhile in your life. As a Christian, something deep inside you is stirred when you contemplate doing something significant for your Lord and Savior before you go home to meet Him. Usually, a meaningful life has, been, has not been limited to interacting with a handful of people with whom that person feels comfortable. Generally, a person whose life matters is engaged with many people from various backgrounds. The truly successful person learns not just how to work with other people, but how to lead people. A successful husband has learned how to lead his wife. A successful father or mother learns how to lead the children in their home. And then, of course, there are many leadership opportunities in both church and business that can add to one's sense of fulfillment. A limited degree of leadership becomes available to almost everyone. But you must advance beyond basic leadership on purpose. In other words, you can just have a child and suddenly you're a leader. You can get married and that man is suddenly the head of a home. But if you're going to move beyond the basics, you've got to do so on purpose. You must make it your goal to accomplish more by involving more people in what you're doing and helping them to be effective at what they're doing so they too can feel purposeful and fulfilled. And that is the very essence of good leadership, helping others achieve. You think leadership, that's about me kicking back in my corner office, and I got a bunch of people who do all the work. And I just sit back, you know, and I'm a Christian. I may not be smoking a cigar, but I'm going to be back there. Maybe I'm playing, you know, play, playing solitaire on my computer. And, I mean, that's, that's how leadership works, isn't it, Brother David Scott? In business, at least, it's pretty much all you do all day, play golf and, and, and sit back in your desk with your hand behind you. No, that guy works his tail off to make it possible for other people to succeed. And his success is measured by the degree of their success. And I wish we as husbands would realize your success as a husband is largely measured to the degree you help your wife succeed. And we as parents, our success is largely measured by the way that we help our kids succeed. Success is measured not in how high you get up on the ladder so that people serve you. Our Lord Jesus taught us that it's a matter of how many people you are serving, how many people you are being a blessing to, how many people you are a help to in this life. It is true, even in ministry, that you must, you must purpose to advance beyond a basic level of leadership. The Bible declares, this is a true saying, if a man desire the office of a bishop, another word for pastor, he desireth a good work. If a man desire the office of a bishop, you've got to pursue it, you've got to go after it. Whether your pursuits are spiritual or secular in nature, you, certain, you soon learn that the climb toward success becomes steep and arduous, especially toward the, the, the beginning. It, it may at times uh, plateau out and it may be get a little easier as you get toward those higher levels, but it never becomes easy per se. It, it, there's always a, a, a perpetual challenge before you but particularly, I'd say, you know, we, we talked about how when you first become a leader, say, by having a child, suddenly you are that, leading that child. And, and, but, but, you know, that part of it may be relatively easy, but from that point on, it's a huge learning curve to, to be a good parent. And there are many times when you get beyond that initial, you know, being simply the jack-in-the-box, uh, you know, shift leader, and you go on to become an assistant manager, perhaps one day a manager of that, of that store, or that restaurant, then you find out uh, it, it, gets, you, it gets tough. And then to be able to, to, to outperform all the other managers and become a regional manager is really tough. So it, 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 it becomes a tremendous challenge to go beyond those, those lower levels of leadership to those higher rungs along the ladder. Reaching the higher elevations of accomplishment requires an, an element that is mysterious to the carnal mind. 
The world calls it luck or good fortune or getting all the breaks or having good connections or knowing how to schmooze. But the Bible-believing Christian should understand the secret in attaining greatly expanded leadership opportunities. It is encapsulated in this scripture. For promotion cometh neither from the east, nor from the west, nor from the south. Now what direction was omitted there? Promotion cometh neither from the east, nor from the west, nor from the south. North, because heaven is on the sides of the north. All right? Just... And, and I'm not going to get into a bunch of speculative stuff, but, they, but I'm told that's, that indeed there's like a, like a black hole that, you know, directly to, to the, the north of, uh, the, the, uh, directly north of our, of our North Pole, somewhere out there in space, that some refer to as, you know, the, the, the gate of heaven. But, but I, I, and, I, and that could be pure, pure foolishness. I, I don't know. But, but, but it is interesting that the Holy Spirit in giving this scripture he says it won't come from the east, west, or south. He neglects to say north because we're told heaven's on the sides of the north. Promotion comes from heaven. And it goes on to say, but God is the judge. He putteth down one and setteth up another. King David had to earn his crown, but Solomon inherited the throne from David. Solomon's reign was marked by magnificent leadership but one must not ignore the source of his authority amongst the princes and nobles of Israel and his power of command that he exerted over the army. We're given this spiritual insight when Solomon assumed power. And Solomon, the son of David, was strengthened in his kingdom and the Lord his God was with him and magnified him exceedingly. What that means is whatever Solomon did, God made it appear bigger than life. God made it all the more impressive. It's, it's as if God put a prism up to, next to Solomon's life. And when you looked at him, he looked so much bigger than the average man. And as they like to say, you know, he, every, you know, uh, he probably put on his robe like any man would, or we would say today, you know, puts his, his pants on one leg at a time like any other man. But nonetheless, the people looked at him in awe because God chose between the leader and the followers to make the leader look strong, great, magnificent, virtually flawless, or uh, with, 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 with perfect perception. Uh, that, that's the way that the people looked. Not to say that he became those things, but that's just how God chose. And that sure me. Uh, I'll finish one thing sentence first. That's how God chose to make Solomon look to the people. Now, I would sure rather have it that than the people look at you like a bumbling idiot. You know, to have the people look at you, you know, as if you're a fool and take you for granted and, and not, not have any respect for your authority. And the difference between people having a neutral view of you or even a negative view of you and having something very positive could well be just that God chooses as a reward to your faithfulness, for your faithfulness to him, to make you look better than you really are. And perhaps that's why sometimes some of us are mystified when uh, it, it, it's such a gratifying thing when your wife looks at you, and though she knows the worst about you, and she's been with you through the, the lowest times of life, but she still looks to you with reverence. That's a wonderful thing. And that's something God, God has to, and I realize he has to work with the man, because I, I appreciate, Brother Scott, how you have in the teen room, the epic teen room, that respect is not given, it's earned. So there, there, is, there is an element of the man having to perform, he has to function properly as a husband and father, he has to earn that respect, but it's wonderful when God moves upon the heart of the wife to give her husband reverence. It's a wonderful thing when it's not just your four-year-old who thinks you're the world's greatest dad or mom, but when they're 14 and 18 and 21 and 24 and they still think you're great. And they come back to you as adults and they, they, they want to know what you have to say about things, what your opinion is about things. They don't want to make a decision before they consult with you. 
that's a very high honor. And it can come not just by you, you know, trying to put on a front, you know, of being fearless or all-knowing or, you know, virtually, you know, God come down from heaven, but, 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 but just you going about your normal business and serving the Lord, honoring Christ, and he chooses then to bless you so that the people that you work with choose to look at you in an elevated state. As you seek to make the most of your life, let me urge you to go beyond getting a good education, working hard, keeping a positive attitude, building a network, and maneuvering yourself to promotion through company politics. Allow me to encourage you to cultivate a strong relationship with the Lord who bringeth low and lifteth up. He raiseth up the poor out of the dust and lifteth up the beggar from the dunghill to set them among princes and to make them inherit the throne of glory. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's and he hath set the world upon them. In other words, if God can do that, God can even make you look good. If you'll cooperate with him, let's ask the Lord to bless us to this morning. Lord Jesus, thank you for this message. And I believe, again, it's not coincidental that this message comes uh, at a time when we're going through a lot of graduations. And people are thinking, especially young people, are thinking about the future. And adults are evaluating their lives since their graduation. And we're just a couple weeks away from Father's Day, and dads are starting to think about their role as, as father. And I pray that you'll use this Lord message to be a blessing to those, plus those who have their eyes on rising above the mediocre and wanting to accomplish some extraordinary things. Lord, help them see that it could be an exercise in futility to try to take on this world and its system in their own flesh and how wise it would be to cooperate with or to partner with the Holy Spirit of God and give you your due so that you in turn can bless that life. Pray that you'll, you'll teach us and help us. We pray this, this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, please, would you take your Bible and turn to Second Chronicles 13.13, 13, 13. 2 Chronicles 13.13. 13. David acknowledged, the Lord lifteth up the meek, he casteth the wicked down to the ground. Now, as I, as I give you that scripture, please don't, under, don't misunderstand my intention. I am not stating that every successful person is meek, for that would be absurd. Neither am I suggesting that every person who is struggling must be wicked, for that would be unjust. But I am stating that if you want the Lord to elevate you in this life, you must strive to be meek and avoid wickedness. An excellent definition of this word meek is submissive to the divine will. To be meek is to be submissive to the divine will. Meek is related to the Hebrew word which means to melt. The meek person is pliable in the master's hand. When, when, the, when the fires of life come upon you, you use it to soften you so he can mold you. He is, he, the, the meek person is easily molded by his creator and developed by his savior. The wicked person, on the other hand, recognizes God's will and turns away from it. There's a lot of wicked people today, and they're not selling drugs or their bodies or someone else. They're not involved in human trafficking. They're not, doing these, they're not a, a child molester. They're not doing any other things that we today would classify as wicked. Nor some of the things we used to say are wicked, we decided to declassify for political correctness. But in the Bible still are abominations, by the way. That, that's, that's, that's not the point. And the point is you can have a person who looks very kindly, very sweet, very loving, but they're wicked in that they know God's will and they refuse to do it. That puts them in that category with all these terrible people we were just describing a moment ago. That's why, too, in hell, 
there's going to be sweet grandmothers who are going to be sharing that terrible place with mass murderers. Because what it boils down to is not, did you commit murder or not? Oh, I never did a, you know, a terrible thing in my life. Well, the terrible thing you did do is you never received Christ as your Savior. And you, you rejected the payment for your sin. And we have a Father in heaven who, who will not accept a person to heaven who tries to come outside of Jesus Christ. By that simple definition of a wicked person recognizing God's will but turning away from it, we can see that Israel's King Jeroboam was a wicked man. In the reign of King Solomon, Jeroboam was a mighty man of valor, very positive. Solomon, seeing the young man, that he was industrious, very positive, he made him ruler over all the charge of the house of Joseph. Now, that was a fabulous promotion for a young man. Jehovah later anointed Jeroboam to be king of Israel when the ten tribes that retained that name of Israel seceded from the two tribes that remained loyal to the descendants of David and became known as the kingdom of Judah. At first, Jeroboam prospered as the king of Israel, but then he became high-minded. Success went to his head. He began to say, look at me. Look at what I have done. Look at who I am. Look at all the people that serve me. He moved from confidence to arrogance, from God's sufficiency to self-sufficiency, from meekness to wickedness. After this thing, Jeroboam returned not from his evil way. And this thing became sin under the house of Jeroboam, even to cut it off and to destroy it from the face of the earth. As is so often the case with backsliders, Jeroboam was able to coast for a while on his past accomplishments. He still looked really good. But when a crisis arose, in this case, a war between the kingdoms of Israel and Judah, Jeroboam had to fight God as well as his Jewish cousins. At first, it looked like Jeroboam's natural leadership abilities would carry the day. Notice, please, 2 Chronicles 13, 13. But Jeroboam caused an ambushment to come about behind them. So they were before Judah. They were, they were in front of the, Jewish, the, 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 the Judean army. And the ambushment was behind them. So they had him between two forces, squeezing him in. It looked like he, brilliant plan. Easy victory. Verse 14, And when Judah looked back, behold, the battle was before and behind, and they cried unto the Lord, and the priests sounded with the trumpets. Then the men of Judah gave a shout, and as the men of Judah shouted, it came to pass that God smote Jeroboam and all Israel before Abijah. Abijah is the opposing king, and Judah. And the children of Israel fled before Judah, and God delivered them, the people of Israel, into their, the people of Judah's, hand. Verse 17, And Abijah and his people slew them with a great slaughter, and there fell down slain of Israel 500,000 chosen men. Then the children of Israel were brought under at that time, and the children of Judah prevailed, because they relied upon the Lord God of their fathers. And Abijah pursued after Jeroboam and took cities from him, Bethel and the towns thereof, and Jeshanon, the towns thereof, and Ephraim with the towns thereof. Neither did Jeroboam recover strength again in the days of Abijah, and the Lord struck him, and he died. Once he, once he fell, he never recovered. Brother Paul, could you bring the temperature up maybe a degree? It's starting to chill down considerably. Pride brought down this man of vast potential because in his conceit, he turned away from God, the very God who had put him in his position of kingship. Would you turn please to Psalm 30, Psalm 30. Both Jeroboam and David became successful leaders, but Jeroboam fell off his pinnacle while David maintained his position throughout his life. And I know you're thinking, as, I, as it passes through my mind as well, David and Bathsheba and his moral failure. But there was still something about David where God did not remove him from the throne. I know there was a time when, when he, he had to flee Jerusalem as his own son 
uh, led an almost successful coup against his father. But the point is, then God let him go back again and reclaim his throne. In other words, he, he was never permanently knocked, knocked off, even with some terrible things that he did. The difference was in the attitude toward God that King David developed as a shepherd boy, maintained as a soldier, and expanded as a king. David testified in Psalm 30. If you drop down, please, to verse 7. Psalm 30, verse 7. Lord, by thy favor thou hast made my mountain to stand strong. Thou didst hide thy face, and I was troubled. I cried to thee, O Lord, and unto the Lord I made supplication. What profit is there in my blood when I go down to the pit? Shall the dust praise thee? Shall it declare thy truth? Hear, O Lord, and have mercy upon me. Lord, be thou my helper. Thou hast turned for me my mourning into dancing. It's almost like between verse 10 and 11. It's almost like David set down his pen, walked away, came back and said, Oh, let me add what the Lord did after I cried out to him and with that prayer. Verse 11, thou hast turned for me my mourning into dancing. Thou hast put, my, put off my sackcloth and girded me with gladness to the end that my glory may sing praise to thee and not be silent. O oh Lord, my God, I will give thanks unto thee forever. David did not just love and appreciate Jehovah in the good times. He clung to the Lord during his many trials, bolstered by the assurance that the Lord would again deliver him and would again prosper him. I'd like you please to move to Daniel 2, verse 36. Daniel 2, 36. It is God's nature to bless his own. One of his promises to Israel that will be fulfilled in Christ's coming kingdom is this. A little one shall become a thousand, and a small one a strong nation. I, the Lord, will hasten it in his time. Though the Jews as a people have rejected their Messiah and grievously offended Jehovah, Christ is still committed to expanding them mightily once they have corporately accepted him and trusted upon him. The same principle will work for you. Though we ardently oppose the prosperity gospel of our charismatic brethren, we do recognize that God assists those who yield themselves to him. And he resists those who withhold themselves from him. Perhaps the surest formula for success was given to the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, who declared, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Daniel is a superb advertisement for the blessings of, a, of godly living. But Daniel's first boss, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, is, all, is also very interesting. You recall, if you know your Bible much at all, how Nebuchadnezzar had a very troubling dream one night, and then he sought an explanation of it from his soothsayers and his wise men, but he couldn't remember the details of the dream. He wanted them to tell him both what the dream was and its interpretation. And they said, that's impossible. It's never been asked before of, of any wise men or soothsayers or magicians by any, any king. And uh, so he, Nebuchadnezzar, you know, Nebuchadnezzar had a way of dealing with that. Uh, you know, when, when there was this, when things kind of clogged up in the office and things weren't being, being finished on time, projects weren't getting done, simple enough. We chop off heads and get a new crew, and they are very motivated to produce. Uh, I don't know if that'll work in modern America, but, but it, was, it worked for ancient Babylon. And uh, so word came to, you know, the, the soldier showed up at Daniel's home, and he was in that, you know, bureaucracy there in Babylon. They're going to kill him and his friends, his Jewish friends. And, he, and Daniel said, whoa, 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 let me consult with God. I think I can give the king what he's asking for. And indeed, the Lord revealed to Daniel the dream and its interpretation. Daniel went to the king. And it's interesting to me that Daniel not only spared his own life and that of his friends, but all those other people, you know, that we would consider to be involved in the occult. But, but there's a merciful aspect of God and the men of God that, that though he, Daniel had their lives in his hand, he chose not to say, spare us, but kill those guys. Kill the guys who are involved in the occult, but spare us who believe in the real God. Now he allowed for, you know, equal opportunity survival. You know, so I kind of appreciate that. 
But he gave that dream. Remember, there was a, he told the king how in your dream you had this, this huge statue, this great image, and w- with multiple uh, medals in it. Each with, and then he began to describe how each of these medals represented different phases of history, starting with Babylon as the head of gold, and working down, and how there would be you know, an outline of history given through this image. And I'm sure you're not shocked to know that, 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 that what Daniel gave Nebuchadnezzar is exactly how you can trace human history since. Because the Bible is infallible. And God gave, the, God gave the prophecy, God gave the interpretation, and it is perfect. And we've seen right down through every detail, right down through uh, the, the, the European Confederation and, and uh, uh, Rome being split into eastern and western halves, represented by the two legs of the, of the image. And, and then uh, the, the eventual split into ten, ten kings that's coming during the reign of the Antichrist. And then how God's going to destroy the whole mess and set up his own kingdom, you know, and through, through Jesus Christ. And uh, so uh, that was the dream. And David interpreted the dream. And, and we see here in Daniel chapter 2, verse 36, Daniel says... This is the dream, and we will interpret the, we will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. Thou, O king, art a king of kings. For the Lord of heaven, for the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power, and strength, and glory. And wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field and the fowls of the heaven hath he given into thine hand, and hath made thee ruler over them all, Thou art this head of gold. The Lord may not make you the head of gold over a vast kingdom, but he can certainly help you, as he helped Nebuchadnezzar, rise through the ranks at work and help you expand your ministry at church. A little bit further plays at Daniel 4.14. I'll be with you in a moment, Daniel 4.14. Nebuchadnezzar serves not only as a positive example of how the Lord can elevate a man to great power and prosperity, but also how the Lord can topple a successful man in his prime if he allows himself to become prideful over his accomplishments. Nebuchadnezzar had a second troubling dream. This time he immediately called for Daniel and shared it with him. He dreamt regarding an angelic being in Daniel 4.14, he cried aloud, he cried aloud and said thus, Hew down the tree and cut off his branches, shake off his leaves, scatter his fruit. And, and you want to guess who the tree represents? That's the king, that's Nebuchadnezzar. And, and then verse 14 continues, Let the beasts get away from under it and the fowls from his branches. In other words, he's going to be abandoned. Verse 15, Nevertheless, leave the stump of his roots in the earth. There's still going to be some potential left behind even with a band of iron and brass in the tender grass of the field, and let it be, let it be wet with the dew of heaven, and let its portion be, a, be with the beasts and the grass of the earth. Let its heart be changed from a man's, and let a beast's heart be given unto him. And that to me opens up so many thoughts. Uh, how, you, you know some guys we say are just animals? There's something to that. And by the way, it doesn't help when you put your kid in a school that teaches them he's an animal. Where he loses his human heart and, beca- and takes on an animalistic characteristic, an, an, an animal's behavior, a beast's heart. It also helps you explain why the Antichrist in Revelation is known as the beast. I've explained, as, as I will talk uh, to people I'm trying to lead to Christ from Revelation 20, verse 10, uh, that where it says, and the beast and the frost, uh, and, and that Satan was cast in like a fire, where the beast and the false prophet are. And I may give just a brief explanation on the beast is the great political leader of the last, last days, and the false prophet is the great uh, religious leader in the world of the last days. And they're in the lake of fire, and there's, there's Satan in the lake of fire, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever, which defeats the, the foolish notion that, you know, we just become annihilated. And that hell is not eternal, or actually the lake of fire is not eternal. The Bible makes it very clear. It's a place of eternal torment for those that are damned. So anyway, uh, and it says at the end of verse 16, and let seven times pass over him. In other words, it's a prophecy of seven years 
Nebuchadnezzar is going to be in this terrible condition. Now, Daniel responded in verse number 24. He says in verse 24, this is the interpretation, O king, and this is the decree of the Most High, which has come upon my Lord the king. For sake of time, let me read quickly, starting at verse 25, that they shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, and they shall make thee to eat grass as oxen. And they, and they shall wet thee with the dew of heaven, and seven times shall pass over thee, till thou know that the Most High ruleth in that kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will. And that's a key point this morning, is God gives authority, he gives opportunity, he gives leadership to whomsoever he will. I just want to be in a position where I can be the recipient of his will for me to succeed. Verse 26, and whereas they commanded to leave the stump of the tree roots, thy kingdom shall be sure unto thee after that, after that thou shalt have known that the heavens do rule. Wherefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable unto thee, and break off thy sins of, by righteousness, and thine iniquities by showing mercy to the poor, if it may be a lengthening of thy tranquility. I'm, your, your, your majesty, I want to have this prophecy put off as long as possible. Maybe even God would, would decide to rescind this judgment upon you. In verse 28, all this came upon the king Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of 12 months, he walked in the palace of the kingdom of Babylon. The king spake and said, is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty? While the word was in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven saying, O king Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it is spoken, the kingdom is departed from thee, and they shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the earth. They shall make thee to eat grasses, oxen, and seven times shall pass over thee until thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will. The same hour was the thing fulfilled upon Nebuchadnezzar, and he was driven from men, and did eat grass as oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven, till the hairs were grown like eagle's feathers, and his nails like bird's claws. In fact, I think I saw Nebuchadnezzar on Piner Avenue the other day. Uh, verse 34, Nebuchadnezzar interjects this testimony in verse 34, and at the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up mine eyes unto heaven, and mine understanding returned unto me. And I blessed the Most High, and I praised and honored him that liveth forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. And he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand or say unto him, What doest thou? At the same time, my reason returned unto me, and for the glory of my kingdom, mine honor and brightness returned unto me. And my counselors and my Lord sought unto me, and I was established in my kingdom, and excellent majesty was added unto me. All this in verse 36, all these wonderful, glorious things were from the hand of God, not because of anything about Nebuchadnezzar. Man, he, he had turned into virtually an animal, in the, living in the fields, living off the grass. But God chose to turn people's hearts back to Nebuchadnezzar and elevate him even higher than he'd been before. Verse 37, now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven. He finally recognizes, I am not the ultimate king. There's a king over me, the king of heaven. Would God, Washington, D.C. would figure that out. All whose works are truth and his ways judgment and those that walk in pride, he is able to abase. You say abase, what does that mean? Around the edging here of our auditorium, we have baseboard. It's the lowest place on the wall. And God abases those that walk. He brings them down to their lowest level when they walk in pride. Just turn please to Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1. This power of God's to lift up and to cast down, to bless and to curse, must not be overlooked when one is planning one's future and determining how to live one's life. Factor God into your life's equation. Or you must be left to fight an enormously cunning and immensely powerful world armed only with your own limited understanding and finite strength. 
Seek him that maketh the seven stars and Orion, and turneth the shadow of death into the morning, and maketh the day dark with night, that calleth for the waters of the sea, and poureth them out upon the face of the earth. The Lord is his name, that strengtheneth the spoiled against the strong, so that the spoiled shall come against the fortress." Or it's people that have been defeated and stripped of everything one day rise up in mighty indignation against their oppressors. That's what God can do. Maybe that explains 1776. Maybe that explains our independence. How this little fledgling, disorganized grouping of odd colonies, 13 in number, could rise up against the world's mightiest empire and win. Because God chose to bless men who had decided that we have no king but Jesus, which was their cry. These Old Testament principles and illustrations are the foundation of a New Testament truth. You cannot hope to be an effective Christian in your own strength or wisdom. Your transformation into the image of Christ is supernatural and can only be accomplished by the Holy Spirit working in you. It was with that understanding that the Apostle Paul wrote Philippians chapter 1, dropping down please to verse number 6, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Man, if you'll get out of the way and let him, Jesus will continue to work in you and work in you and work in you until one day your family, your friends, you yourself will not recognize you as the same person you were 10 years ago. And that is how you have to evaluate this stuff, brother. Don't, don't say, well, I'm going to start reading my Bible, and after a week, let's see where I'm at. No, I tell you what, you read your Bible, you pray, you get in church, you get under sound preaching, you get involved, you, st- you help us get the gospel into the community, and let's see where you are in a year, and five, and ten, compared to your friends and your relatives who've gone a different direction. Verse number nine, Philippians 1, 9. And this I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment, that you may approve things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. Verse 11, being filled with the fruits of righteousness which are by Jesus Christ under the glory and praise of God. Beloved, every good thing, every perfect thing comes from, 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 the, from the Father of lights from whom there is no variableness nor shadow of turning. You cannot hope to be an effective Christian in your own strength. Please consider the ramifications of that statement. You cannot be a good husband or wife, a good father or mother, a good Bible preacher or teacher, a good soul winner or counselor, a good ministry leader, nor even a good disciple of Jesus Christ without the personal involvement of the Lord in the affairs of your life. I will even go so far as to say that you as a Christian will never reach your full potential in secular endeavor, such as business or career, without God working on your behalf. You say, no, Pastor, wait a minute, that's a silly statement because all the top rungs of our company are filled with lost people. Man, they've got incredible amounts of money and power and prestige and, and so many people know them and honor them. I realize that. But I believe, what I'm trying to say to you is that you as a Christian try to shove God aside and do it in your own strength. Not only do you have the world, the flesh, and the devil to contend with, you've got a very upset Holy Spirit who is jealous over you. And he is not going to let one of his children continue on in rebellion indefinitely. And, and so I'm just trying to say, it'd be better to cooperate with him than try to go against him. Remember, he raiseth up the poor out of the, out of the dust and lifteth up the beggar from the dunghill to set him among princes and to make them inherit the throne of glory and the pillars of the earth of the Lord's. And he hath set the world upon them. And the Lord magnified Solomon exceedingly in the, day of, in the sight of all Israel. And bestowed upon him such royal majesty as had not been on any king before him in Israel. For promotion cometh neither from the east, nor the west, nor from the south. Where does it come from then? The north. But God is judge, he putteth down one and setteth up another. The Lord lifteth up the meek and casteth the wicked down to the ground. 
being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. The level of God's interest in you is determined by the level of your submission to him. In a moment, I'm going to have you bow your head and close your eyes. We're going to go into a time of invitation, but I just want to explain very quick. We have a number of visitors. I just want to explain briefly that if God has spoken to your heart and you don't know for sure if you were to die, whether your soul would go to heaven or hell, you don't know for sure you have God's gift of eternal life. And we want to help you if you'll let us. I'm going to invite you in just a moment when we stand, if you'll come right out from your seat and come right to me. And if someone's blocking you away, could you just simply say, excuse me? You come right to me. I'll have a man take a man, a lady take a lady, and show you from the Bible how you can have an assurance of heaven. If you've been saved and never been baptized, if you'll come to me and say, Pastor, I'd like to be, sa- I'd like to be baptized this morning or tonight, now yeah, we'd be so thrilled. If there's any other major spiritual decision you need to share with me, I'm available either now or after the service. But we also have a custom in our church where for a few moments, this simple platform becomes an altar where God's people will often kneel and conduct some business with God. Somehow the Lord spoke to their heart during the sermon, and they right before their heart can grow cold, they want to come and kneel before the Lord. Some who cannot kneel will come and stand, and it's a place to do business with God. You're welcome to avail yourself of that if you're a Christian. Now as we bow our heads and close our eyes, Lord Jesus, I do pray that you'll please work in our midst If there's anyone here unsure of their salvation, their eternal destiny, give them the courage, Lord, to avail themselves of this opportunity to have someone show them from the Bible how they can be saved. Lord, if anyone's here and they've trusted Christ as Savior but never been biblically baptized, again, Lord, provide courage and a determination to fulfill that first great thing you ask of us after we're saved, that first great act of obedience to follow Jesus and believers' baptism. And then, Lord, otherwise, would you just work amongst your people and help us to realize, especially we who are men, and we, we, we like being self-sufficient. We like being self-made men. May we realize how foolish that is when the power of heaven can be deployed on our behalf and can help us, Lord, and not necessarily to reach the the pinnacles of corporate power and and wealth, but to provide very well for our families and, and expand ourselves into doing something for God. Even if it means we're not quite so successful in the world's eyes, we don't quite gain everything the world says equals success, may we realize that if we're putting first the kingdom of God and your righteousness... That is a successful man. That is a successful woman. And whatever things you add to us, may we appreciate and enjoy, but never live for the things. May the things serve us as we serve you. And we thank you for this in Jesus' name. As we stand together, please, beloved, as our, as our instrument plays, the altar is open for a few moments, and we invite you to come. If you need Christ as Savior, come right to me. If you need to be baptized, come right to me. If you just want to come and kneel for a few minutes and ask God to bless and to help you, and perhaps give you that spiritual element to success. Now, I'm not trying to give you a Christianized version of Napoleon Hill's Think and Grow Rich. This is not a matter of pray and grow rich or pray and be successful. But I'm just trying to lay out to you that when you submit yourself to the Lord, let him have control. He'll do for, far more with your life than you will leaving it, leaving it in your own hands and your own power. You'll, you'll just go so far and you'll, you'll peter out. But with God, you have before you infinite potential, infinite possibilities. Allow him to take you where he would, as far as he will. You're hearing number 167 in the background, just as I am. When it comes back around, Brother David Scott will lead us in this song of invitation. You respond as you feel led.
join us on hymn number 167, 167. for just a moment, please, before we sing the last verse. If you're here this morning and say, boy, Pastor, I just felt such a need to receive Christ as my Savior, but I, I just I just felt glued to the spot. It was like I couldn't move. I, I just was intimidated by people around me, and, and I, I just, and I know they'd want me to do it, but I just couldn't seem to work up the nerve. And Pastor, I, I'd like you to pray for me. I'm not sure of my salvation, but if it's possible for a human being to know for sure their sins are forgiven and they have a home in heaven, I want to know. If, if I can pray for you to that end without embarrassing you at all, just, well, all our heads are bowed and eyes are closed, just me looking around. That's your desire. Pastor, I'm not sure that I'm saved, but I'd like to know for sure. Anyone here like that at all? All right. Let's sing together the last verse will be dismissed. Just as I am, thou wilt receive, wilt welcome, pardon, cleanse, relieve, because thy promise I believe, O Lamb of God. Praise the Lord. I'm going to pray and we'll be dismissed. Uh, let's think on these things that we've heard today, um, how you know many of us could have a lot of things and it can be taken away from us if we don't follow the Lord. And uh, we see two examples of um, Nebuchadnezzar and, and we see how David, you know, how he um, was spared, as Pastor mentioned. Uh, even though he did some great sin, he humbled himself and asked for forgiveness and was able to um, keep his kingdom, and uh, he was able to pass that on to his son, Solomon, um, and he was blessed uh, beyond measure, and we taught on that today in Sunday school, how he was the only one in the Bible that was a man after God's own heart, and uh, we, uh, we need to strive to be um, worthy of that same calling and that same uh, label. So let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we praise your name for this day. Thank you for this message that you've laid on the pastor's heart. Lord, I pray that um, as we leave today, we will think on these things and help us to uh, live to 
uh, strive to live holy and righteous and, and to um, follow what you've called us to do. And, and Lord, I pray that each one of us, if there's some secret sin in our lives, even now, that you would bring it to mind and, and help us to uh, humble ourselves and come and ask for forgiveness and, and repent of those sins, Lord. Uh, maybe it's an addiction or maybe it's um, some other unforgiven um, sin in their lives. I pray that today each one of us would uh, have that brought up to mind. I pray if there is one here that's still struggling in this area of salvation, Lord, I pray that they'd grab the hand of a uh, pastor or Mrs. Merrick or uh, one of the ushers and ask, what must I do to be saved? I pray, Lord, you bring us back safely again tonight uh, for a wonderful evening, a, a blessed message, and uh, for a graduation of a special young lady. And we'll praise your name for what you'll do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you.